Okay, this lesson for our Corne Project class concerns the evaluative approach. Often you hear me speak of a full scope evaluation or in hermeneutics uh, as we were trained a holistic where we take a literally a full scope view, include everything. So that would go back to our languages, the Bible languages, English, Greek, Hebrew, lexography, syntax, grammar. That would include our application of those tools, all that's framed within our systematic theology where we take a categorical approach, hermeneutics, we take a holistic approach, and then in our languages we take the um, lexical, syntactical, um, linguistics, if you will, inflectional morphemes, things like that, so, so that it doesn't become too crowded and we don't become overwhelmed. This five categories one, two, three, four, five, and then eight elements. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then I just take, for example, the first letter in the five major constructs. This is named after a man named John Calvin, a Martin Luther, a Jacob Arminus. I can't pronounce this. A man named Molina, and a man named Pelagius. So. You'd have to want to study all of those gentlemen, but popular assertions uh, and formed categories becomes almost a jargon. Acronyms are out there, so I made, went ahead and made one uh, using those letters to remember CLAMP. And then, of course, this one uh, has an acronym, so let's just write in T U L I. P. So there's five of the elements within the construct Calvinism. So that if we practice target, meet, and qualify, target mean pick one, aim at one. So let's, if we target this one, we start here, for example, then we'll just use the remaining, uh, if you will, this grid to note some items. And first and foremost, we can go ahead and write what we all notice or sometimes we don't recall or remember because we can be with people who are so invested in a construct that they're unprepared to remember, recall that it's fallible. The construct is only the scriptures are infallible. Only the scriptures have context that are divinely designed and intelligently inspired to assure that the intended purpose of the author namely Holy Spirit, who superintended the scriptures and their composition, uh, his message and his purpose for the text. John's gospel specifically names the purposes so that you might believe, would believe that Jesus is the Christ. And then as one who's believing, you might have life in his name, John 20, 31. So we'll go ahead and let's look at, I try, I'll do this because it's like a dashboard. You can use Excel, things like that. But if you really want to evaluate something and define, document, and disclose, you'd really have to have a superordinate purpose for doing so as a pastor in one of the Lord's churches, which is easy for me to call and describe accordingly because we have no vested interest in supporting fallible constructs or following lesser men than Christ. So Landmark, for example, in Jacksonville is... A congregation with a king Jesus. I know everyone calls him king that are believers. A song even came out, Amazing Love, and how could my king who died for me, and I never really found an aversion for Jesus being the king of an individual and certainly wouldn't understand the aversion of Jesus being the king of that particular congregation in Jacksonville, Arkansas. I'm never understood that, but it is odd when people have a, an aversion to what the Bible uh, states specifically. So he's the king of his congregation. Uh, he even mentioned and gave us uh, insight to his attitude ag against those who do not desire that he should reign upon, that's a contact word, and do not want to have his reign in contact with them, uh, and specifically in the ecclesia where the church letter Revelation uh, speaks of him conducting in his churches and even has a vision of him conducting there in those seven candle stands, if you will, or lamp stands. So uh, king of the congregation, head of the body, 
which were 100% his body. Uh, he's the shepherd of that particular flock of which we're 100% his flock. He's 100% our shepherd. So I'm not sure, uh, unless you're working in the ecclesia, you know, wanting to define, document, disclose the fallible elements really will just continue to place you in one of these categories, uh, camps or affiliates. You'll just be an affiliate or an advocate of one of these constructs. Now, in social science, observations have been made that the degree of polarization, that is how far apart these can be, such as categories, such as young, as far removed you can be from old earth, young versus old, uh, that serves the interest, um, uh, the polarization serves the degree of interest in having an in-group so that you can then have an out-group. And then the in-group uh, and out-group can be so demarcated as to catalyze the essential friction for their reality or for their purpose of being. So let's go ahead and let's look at theism. I believe it's called closed theism. Just as a noteworthy. And then there's an axiom of Reformed theology that is also agreed and, and asserted by some who consider themselves high Calvinist, namely regeneration precedes faith. And then there is the actual, um, let's say, here for us in what we're doing, when we talk about uh, what is the, how is the, let's just do a demonstration. Let's just call this our demo. So let's demonstrate what the text says and then go from there. So total depravity, I noticed I found an article uh, by Calvinist that says total and then they put, but not utter. Now that's devastating because now we we will retain the letter T for total depravity, but now we've qualified it, but is a subordinating conjunction. So our Calvinistic assertion that we have now is the hinge upon which all the others must turn and they will stand or fall accordingly has now been qualified. This is because later research and study and someone noticed, hey, uh, Jesus himself said that you being evil, being evil, uh, speaking of um, the ontology of their being, the very uh, essence of ontology, the study uh, nature of being and what is something in actuality. He said, while being evil, you are, you notice to give good gifts. So being evil and doing good are found juxtaposed in the Bible and they aren't found to be contradicting. So we noticed in studying the Bible that we're creating God's Im image and then later it says Adam uh, fathered children in his image. So the being evil came from Adam and the knowing to do good comes from God. So that's retained and then the other feature is a stain upon us. So we have the uh, image of God, the image of Adam within the same person. And that's interesting. So what do we do here? Well, Calvinists have already, I guess, I suppose it's now a lowercase t. That's something we could do. But again, unless you have value to study, to define, document, and disclose or then to target something as we're doing Calvinism and then engage it, M-E-E-T, meet it, and then qualify it. You won't notice, but some have already done that. Unconditional election, unless you define the word election as what it is, reasoned out, you would never notice, and we're just borrowing this grid, I'll need some room here, but reasoned out, out that word is actually out from, and it begs the question, from what? Well, that's the call out. See, and then that takes you out from, and then you answer, 
So he's calling men to come out from. And at one point he said, I didn't come to call the righteous uh, to repentance, but rather sinners. So there were people who were in a right relationship and had trusted Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. They had believed the prophets who were sent by the Father to preach the coming Messiah, and they had trusted. And so uh, they didn't need a mind in association with God, the Father of Jesus, nor with the prophets that he sent, nor with the message they proclaimed, nor with the Messiah they, of whom they spoke, because they were already in association with the Messiah of whom the prophets spoke, the prophets who spoke of the Messiah, and the Father who sent the prophets. So he says, then there were those who needed to be, needed to mind in association with. So called out from those unminded ones, those unminding in association with, with God, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. Remember Moses and the prophets, the statement by Abraham that since they are not listening to Moses and the prophets, Luke 30, I mean, Luke 16, 31, the prophets, and then the message, the message, and then finally the Messiah. So there's a lot to be in association with of whom they spoke. So, so those unminding in association with God, the Father of Jesus, the prophets he sent, the message they preached, and the Messiah of whom they spoke. That So there's much here that has really, this is very trite. Uh, I'll just say this is a trite. It's, it's unintelligible. It has no form. It's formless. As we notice that when something lacks form, it lacks intelligibility. This is like taking a text out of context, or as I illustrate to youngsters, it's like removing a goldfish from a fishbowl. It won't take long. You, you won't have a goldfish anymore and just something that, uh, is problematic. So here, limited atonement. You notice this is one side of another side of two formed categories where atonement has now been uh, set apart, demarcated accordingly, and yet the Bible uh, speaks of atonement. Atonement is for sins. Redemption is for kins. Thus we have kinsman redeemer. So the qualifier here is are you related to the redeemer? And we are only are related to the redeemer when we enter Christ by faith. We're only mind in association with God the Father of Jesus who sent the prophets who preached the message of the Messiah. And we're only in association with the Messiah when we are persuaded we then listen, that is, we learn. We then trust into Christ Jesus, and we're the ones that come to Jesus. Irresistible grace, we have a text where it says we resist the Holy Spirit. So until you define grace, this is undefined. Because if you can resist the one, the Holy Spirit who is fully God... You remember we have one God, one being, three persons, each person fully God, yet one being, the one true God who is one being, three persons. So having a text where it says you do always resist the Holy Spirit and then knowing the Trinity, now we have to ask ourselves of what are we speaking but to say it's resistible or irresistible lacks intelligibility. There is no context. But we now have a recollection of the discretion of God in Jeremiah 10, 12, where it speaks of the world, the earth, has all been established by his discretion. That's his infinite wisdom. Well, we have an example of Sodom, where he said, had the miracles that were done in you, speaking of cities, Capernaum is one I will um, 
remember, we'll, we'll use for an example. So here's Capernaum, Caper. Oh, that's good. So if we have Sodom and Caper, just for short, and let me have some fun while I'm working. So he said Sodom, his patience stopped with them. But notice his patience stopped with them while they were, while still able to be persuaded. Notice this, by miracles. They were still able to be persuaded. Capernaum, however, this caper here, these were now unable. They were now unable to be persuaded by miracles. And we learned that it was because of God's discretion, his infinite wisdom and understanding. Psalm 147.5 says his understanding is infinite. He made an example, an example of Sodom. So that those in the future being about to participate in their sins and that way of life would not do it. So this is interesting because these people, his patience endured them to where they were now beyond. They were unpersuadable. You remember we have a word in the Bible, unpersuadable. And of course you can look that up sometime. You can, unpersuadable, there we go. And that's not a condition that you would really desire to find yourself in. But to suppose that you are the governor, the Lord, the controller of your circumstances. I didn't decide who my parents would be, when I would be born, where I would be born. I didn't decide that I'd be born in the Bible Belt. I didn't decide that my father, who wasn't um, raised up in one of the Lord's New Testament churches, I didn't decide for him to take me to church that Sunday. Matter of fact, I remember when parents would take their children to church, even if the children like myself didn't want to go and didn't want to attend. So we were taken there, dragged there, if you want to say the truth about it. And it was a lot of trouble for mom and dad to take three boys who'd rather be outside playing, put us together, clean us up, put on the proper clothes. There were standards then that were well known and you would get ready and wear your what used to be called Sunday best. And so we would go, and I didn't decide to be there on that particular day when the pastor uh, didn't decide that his message would be just for me. So all those that are called circumstances, uh, elements uh, of what we call an event of chance, which Ecclesiastes says an event of, or yeah, an event of chance will befall all of us. Now, that could be positive or negative. In that particular text, it was saying that an event of chance would stop even the fastest runner from, it all, from him always being the one who wins the race or the smartest person always gaining the wealth or the strongest person always winning the battle because a, an event of chance will befall us all. Well, on the positive side, it's God's discretion that left these people here and he came, and when he arrived, he indicted them, saying that Sodom would have repented in view of those miracles, which means they were still persuadable. But because of God's discretion, and thank God for that, because I would hate to be the one to make the call to say, okay, let's shut off your patience and endurance with Sodom, or let's turn it off. See, I would have thought, let's turn it off here with these Capernaumites, which that would... See, I wouldn't know when and... I would never know what's best to do in that case. That's why we preach the gospel. But speaking of resistible, irresistible, you'd have to really ask, how is it I can resist the person, Holy Spirit, for example, who's fully God, and then in the same breath say that I cannot, and yet we have a negation of the word grace. We even have the word unthankful, which means unfavorable, unfavorable. So that's enough said there. But again, Take your five, take your eight, then target this one. So we'll just ignore those. We'll take these that we have. Perseverance, that's a fruit. That's fruit of spirit. That's Galatians 5.22. 
And you remember in the churches in the southern region of Galatia, they were so quickly removed from the one who called them by an unmerited favor from Christ that Paul marveled expressing the attitude of the one who superintended the inspiration. Holy Spirit's marveling that these people are so uh, soon transposed themselves away from the one who called them in an unmerited favor from Christ. He said they were now bewitched. He said that persuasion's not from God, but he had to tell them. So obviously this trait, which in the context of a new covenant congregation, an assembly, a church, for example, this trait reciprocates. And this is like the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the perseverance, the gentleness, the goodness, the meekness, the temperance, and the faith. So much so does it reciprocate that Jesus said that in this covenant community, his that he walked with and taught in, while he was here on the earth, he told them that their reciprocal love one for another would prove that the Father sent him into the world. So that perseverance outside of context to say, well, you'll hang on until you get to heaven is quite, um, well, I'll just say that's a trite, very trite, empty. It's empty of any of the implication for which the trait is given. For example, my father didn't develop my character and give me uh, behavioral traits that he developed and then others that he removed from me through his discipline and love for me to discipline me uh, so that I could someday when I died, I would wake up in heaven because somehow that's what those were for. Uh, that That's it's for me to be the husband I am to the wife, the father I am to the children, the brother I am in the covenant in the context of the new covenant assembly and to assure that God receives the glory. That's by Christ Jesus in the ecclesia. So there's much more involved here than what it's been reduced to. This thing of get to heaven or not um, has been now portrayed as the um, ultimate end in mind, totally voiding why Christ came here and established what he did at church on earth, voiding in the sense that it would suppose that we have a greater end in mind. We're serving Christ's interest here and now the same that we'll be serving throughout all eternity, assuring his Father receives the glory and that would be by Christ Jesus. Now, closed theism, I only use that as an example because you have the open and closed. That, again, has enough polarization to generate value for in-groups. Uh, you'll have the opposite of that would be open, people call it that. Those are formed categories. I told you about a website, CARM, C-A-R-M, where he actually has separated open and closed verses. Uh, no such thing like that. That's an absurdity. Uh, we have living theism, living God, from the Torah to the Revelation. But again, outside of the covenant community, what relevance would there be for knowing the implications of the living God outside the ecclesia? And that's why uh, there's uh, those who work independently, that is outside and apart from the Lord's churches, uh, and they don't resource the churches, they don't encourage, they don't even direct, let's say, someone they might influence or persuade to trust Jesus they don't even direct them to a particular ecclesia where they would then be baptized into that ecclesia. That is Christ, Ephesians 5.32, Romans 6, baptized into Christ, Galatians, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, put on Christ. So we believe into Christ, we're baptized into Christ, our fellowship's into Christ, according to Philippians, the first chapter, fifth verse. We then uh, learn uh, to self-examine, self-correct, present ourselves at the Lord's table. We're submitted, we are submitted in that posture of fellowship in the gospel to be um, submitted to correction from spiritual ones, from teachers, from the word of God, from the teaching of it, from the learning and growing together, the iron sharpening the iron. So living God uh, context. So that was just an example. Regeneration precedes faith. That was qualified as, but not temporally, which that really takes it into some kind of abstract. Uh, it had to be outside the ecclesia to have that conversation. I mean, if you're bored and you want to think in terms, whatever that would be. And this is because we can demonstrate from the Bible that regeneration is occurs between believe and then believing. There we go. And then you cross-reference 
John 20, 31, and then you can cross-reference 1 John 5, 1. And so now you notice that if you really want to do this, because a lot of people are so engaged in friction that no one would notice, not even they, they may not even be, they may be incognizant of the fact that they have not even evaluated that against they or that by which they're aggravated. Uh, so people can be easily triggered. Uh, as I remind you all, you may pull a trigger, but you didn't load the gun. They were primed long before you arrived. They aren't trained nor interested in comparing what they believe, let's say a fallible construct, with the text because it doesn't serve their interest of their in-group, if you will. So instead of it's a, in, instead of infallible scriptures, context, the aim and purpose for which those are written, group. And there's really not an indictment. Uh, except it's true of all of us. We all have our things we'd like to uh, suppose to be infallible, things we have reasoned out ourselves. But apart from a covenant community and ecclesia, apart from the Lord's churches, like the one he started the day he arrived until those that he's still in association with all throughout the last 2,000 years, evaluating these according to the scriptures and defining document disclosed in the fallible elements serves really no aim and purpose except to catalyze conflict or uh, trigger volatility and more friction. But within the ecclesia, the context in which living God occurs is very holds great implication because of the truth of the ecclesia and what the ecclesia is, namely the ecclesia that is limited and defined by Christ. So you have a blessed day. Enjoy this lesson. But this is a good way to just format it, set it all down, and then it will help you understand how, as I try to tell people, how I think is according to a grid, a matrix, and I put everything in the boxes and it all works out. So you have a blessed day.